Have you ever wondered how successful architecture, engineering, and construction companies scale their business? Or have you ever wanted guidance on how to get more growth, wealth, and freedom from your AEC company? Well, then you are in luck. Hi, I'm Will Forat. And I'm Justin Nagel, and we're your podcast hosts. We interview successful AEC business leaders to learn how they use people, process, and technology to scale their businesses. So sit back and get ready to learn from the industry's best. This is Building Scale. Hey listeners, it's Will here. Our mission is to help the AEC industry protect itself by making technology easy. If you've ever listened to our show, then you know that the three pillars of scaling a business are people, process, and technology. So if you suspect technology is your weak link, then book a call with us to see where we can help maximize your company's IT and cybersecurity strategy. Just go to buildingscale.net slash help. Today's guest is the CEO of Cultivate Advisors, Casey Clark. Casey is a passionate entrepreneur who got his start owning a home service franchise. After nearly a decade, he successfully exited with 90 plus franchise owners and over 600 employees. Casey co-founded Cultivate Advisors in 2014, one of the largest small business advising firms in North America. Cultivate is helping thousands of business owners reach their growth objectives through cash flow management, core business skill development, and scalable systemization. For the last five years, Cultivate has ranked high on the Inc. 5000 list of fastest growing private companies in the United States. And the mission of Cultivate Advisors is to partner with committed entrepreneurs to propel their business beyond expectations. We're really excited about this episode already. Casey, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah, we um we we on the outside, not not it's 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 public. We love you. We we're very, very in in love with your brain. Uh, you know, what you what you did early in your career, amazing. And now what you're doing and helping others is even more amazing, more impactful, more purposeful, and 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 certainly my perspective. So I uh yeah, not not full man crush, little man crush, you know, not not Partial my uh crush. not my full my full man crush, but you're you're getting there, Casey. So uh with that said, tell us uh tell us the origin story. Tell us about the the initial business and then tell us about cultivating. Yeah, well, you know, so franchising is is a great is a great way to learn how to run a business, right? Go into a system that already has the marketing, already has the processes in place, and it's really about who can execute, operate, and lead at the highest level possible. And that's that's usually who kind of rises and creates some of the bigger businesses within those networks. So, you know, no doubt, I, I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, um, but it was mostly from a an edge of just I wanted to make money, and people don't give you opportunities when you're young. And I said, well, I'll just go do it myself then. Um, and from there it, it kind of took off and I realized I'm actually okay at this. Like I'm, I'm, I'm decent at it. You know, like every other entrepreneur it kicks off, like, you know, face planted a bunch of times, but, um, you know, that was, that was really what, what kind of led me into down this franchise pipe was just, I got to pay the bills and I got to figure out how to, you know, get to a level that I was kind of shooting for. Um, and then cultivate came along, you know, when I was in the franchising space, I got to see all these entrepreneurs that all ran franchises and I got to, I got to see that. With all the same support, all the same systems, all the same capital infusion, all, all all things similar, why was there such a dichotomy when it came to the results and the success, right? Such a variance. Um, and I became obsessed with what was really the DNA of an entrepreneur, what really allowed an entrepreneur to scale, what really took place. And I, I realized the parts I loved about that business was sitting across from the table, working on an integrated marketing strategy or putting together the right plans. And I said... I wonder if we could take this outside of franchising, actually go and grow and scale and take business owners and really turn them in to CEOs. And we've we've expanded with other products and services as we've grown and scaled and even acquired several companies. But, um, you know, ultimately, uh, Cultivate started with that vision of let's make the world better for entrepreneurs. Um, and here we are today. So you had mentioned teach people to be CEOs. What what? If you start a business, aren't you just the CEO? Isn't that how it works, Casey? On LinkedIn, yeah, yeah. Everybody <laughs> puts the title of CEO. Um, that's a that's a normal thing to see. But I, I think there is a difference, right? There's a difference between are you running this business as a business owner or are you running this business as a CEO? And I, I think it's very, very different between the two. And if, you can give yourself whatever title you want. I've never been a title person. I find most entrepreneurs aren't. Um, but, uh, you know, 
it doesn't matter the title you put on the business card or the email signature. What matters is how are you actually running the business? And I think a lot of people talk about owner dependency, right? Or like, I want to grow and scale the organization or gosh, you know, I really like the business to stop running me so I can actually, you know, how can I figure out how to run the business versus being the victim of the business? Um, you know, and it's, there's, you know, business owners have the highest uh, divorce rate. CEOs do not have the highest divorce rate, right? Business owners, um, you know, I've, I've unfortunately had a, a high suicide rate. You don't see that same thing with CEOs. So it's it's a it's a it's a way to think about the business that I find not every owner is always able to get themselves into that groove or into that mindset. When does when in your eyes or in the systems that cultivate put in place? When do you graduate from business owner to CEO? What is that? What does that graduation look like? I was like, you've done it. You know, uh, there's a point in business when people say like. No, like you actually run a business. This isn't just a, a side hustle. This isn't just a thing. Like you actually have yeah. a business that has been successful five, 10 years. Like you, you're a real business owner. Like that's not like a made up thing. When is that next level of, oh, now, like now you're a CEO. Like now you've also elevated. Yeah. So I think, you know, we, we, I talk a lot about these, these five stages that I think every entrepreneur goes through. And I can, I can speak to this here in a moment, but I think I think the, the difference between business owner and CEO, if you like, if you wanted to draw a line, and I'm going to tell you right now, it's a very ugly, squiggly line that's very gray, and lots of different shades <laughs> to be able to cross the vortex. <laughs> Rainbow um, colored fuzzy lines. Okay, got yeah, it. Yeah, very, very, very fuzzy. This is not a this is not a straight saw cut here, um, you know, to get from A to B. But what what I'll tell you is that it, it does come down to usually owner dependency. If you were to measure the actual dependency of the owner. Um, are you are you actually casting a vision? Are you sharing that vision with others? Meaning it's not only your vision anymore, right? A business owner is like, this is my business. You work for me. Um, and I have to have control over everything because I'm a business owner and this is my business. And I did this because I want it to be the way I want it to be, right? That's the business owner mentality. The CEO mentality is I'm going to cast a vision, but I'm going to listen to everybody else on my team and understand what their vision is. We're going to create a shared vision, you know, you're a CEO when there's decisions happening in your organization and you don't actually like them, but you're going with them because it's a consensus within the organization. And, and we're all in pursuit of this, you know, North Star that we're chasing. And I think that that that's the only way to actually figure out how to give up control. You know, I'm a big golfer. I used to be terrible at golf. Now I'm only somewhat bad at golf. Right. But when I first started, the reason why I was terrible is I would grip. I, I grew up playing hockey and I would grip this club so hard, right? And then you finally take lessons and you start to realize like, hey man, you don't have to squeeze the lights out of this grip. Like, you know, loosen the grip a little bit. Business owners are usually very tightly gripped. And then CEOs are usually starting to understand that it's influence and leading through others that allow you to actually get the scale. So it's it's really when Happy Gilmore learns to putt. That's essentially what you're telling me? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. That's a good, that's a good analogy. I might steal that one. <laughs> so we... We've talked in a few previous episodes about this, and I like to talk about this is the difference. So CEO is equivalent to where you are actually scaling or are able to scale the business, whereas your version of uh, owner, business owner, is a lifestyle business. Everything traverses through essentially that single point. And so if that uh, the scalable business, if they sell, they can sell for a lot. Uh, and the business owner, uh, the one that likes to have everything going through them, that's not actually as valuable, not nearly as valuable. Yeah, I mean, you know, we cultivate, obviously, a lot of things that we get asked is like, well, how do you know you're successful in helping these companies grow and scale? Some companies might have already grown and scaled on their own behalf. And that's absolutely true, right? There's there's a mix of people that we look at and go, they would have never grown and scaled without us. There's others like, they were already in the mode of scale. We just made it way more valuable in terms of how they scale it. So we always measure ROI based on enterprise value. How much enterprise value are we creating of what this business will be worth when you go to do a transaction or when you go to sell the organization? And I don't care what anybody says. You have to build the business to be ready at some point to sell. And people will say, no, I want to run this the rest of the time. It's a lifestyle business. No, it's not. Like, because all lives end, number one. Number two right? You never know what's going to, you know, disrupt you or going to happen in your life. You don't know what's around the corner. And I'll just tell you right now, when you build a business this way, it's actually just more fun to run. And the, the way to think about it is like, 
you know, when people go to sell a house, right? People sell houses all the time. And what happens? Like, oh, I got to go sell the house. I know. I'll declutter it. I'll clean it all up. I'll get all the work done on the home so it looks really nice because people are going to walk through and judge me, even though they have no idea who you are. But as they go through the house and they're trying to figure out if they want to buy it and, and, and they start to put it on the market, the people actually themselves, the owners start to go, this is kind of nice. Like, this is actually, I, I, why wasn't I living in it this way? Why didn't I get this done so I could enjoy it? Oh, wow. It's like everything's so clean. It feels so good. I'm more productive now. So, you know, just something to think about is like when you get the business cleaned up and you get the systems in place and you get it to a, another level of enterprise value and that clean, it's actually more fun to run. So what you're really saying is, uh, you know, the last bit just before they sell, they realize where it should have actually been. Do do any of them not sell because of it or do oh, yeah. decide to delay the selling? Absolutely. They go, actually, now I love this. more more the persona of business owners, right, that are coming in going, I want to sell because this is taking a toll on my life or I just I've been at this for too long. I'm burned out or, you know, and then it's like, oh, I didn't realize there was another way to run this business. And I I want to be careful for people listening in. This isn't this isn't a scale or, you know, grow revenue at all cost. Uh thought process. I just want to be very clear. There's a difference. You can become a CEO and have five employees. I'm not, I'm not as focused on like, you have to scale to a certain level to be able to call yourself a CEO. At some point though, you have to acknowledge what is, how the CEO behaves versus how a business owner behaves. That's what we're talking about. I can talk about different stages of scale here in a moment, but those are the two, those are the two things you have to think through and go, which, which side of the paradigm am I going to be on? So a lot of these businesses, uh, we talked a, uh, a little bit about entrepreneurship. Um, and so to you, what is what is entrepreneurship? Uh, pro- I mean, I think a lot of people say a lot of different things, but I, I would say for me personally, entrepreneurship is the the ability to make an impact and and have somewhat some type of influence on what that impact is mm-hmm. for me. So, oh, so. Is entrepreneurship, is it a job? Is it a lifestyle? Is it a purpose? What, what is it? I think it can be all of the above because I've seen people become entrepreneurs for the purpose of having a specific lifestyle. I've seen people become entrepreneurs uh, because they they created their own job and that's what actually gave them comfort and structure and made them feel more comfortable. And then there's there's also this other place of entrepreneurship that's like, you know, a lot of people would call it the American dream. Uh, that like, that's a, a phrase that people would call it for whatever reason. Um, and, and, you know, I think that's more people are, are chasing, you know, jumping social classes practically. Like that's usually the motivation behind it. Um, you know, for most, uh, in terms of, of what it becomes. You mentioned impact, right? Like that being actually having controllable or having control over the impact that you have influence, yeah. in, influence, uh, on this impact where uh, where does that fit into play with entrepreneurship? When you think of true impact uh, on lots of things, it can be you know, impact on the individuals in your company. It could be impact on the environment. It can be an impact on community. It can be yeah. impact on you just personally, your uh, social scale, as you mentioned. Wh- where does that fit in? Where does the impact fit into the entrepreneur um, well, if you were, formula? <laughs> well, if you were to take 100 entrepreneurs and put them in the room, right, that started a business and go, why did you start this business? I would, I would venture to guess that 70 to 80% of people within their answer is going to mention they thought they could do their product, service, or widget better than somebody else and give a different output or a different impact to, to be the consumer or to what it, you know, what the product or service does in the marketplace. And generally it is a it's a desire of innovation or a desire to say, like, this can be done better. This can be done in a different way. And I'm excited to shift that impact in, in, in the world or, you know, within the industry or whatever it might be. Um, and so for that reason, that's where impact sits. I, I think at the root of it, if, if entrepreneurs really sit down and remove the money, remove the autonomy, you know, remove the control, you know, need, it, it usually all lands consistently at impact. And the owners that burn out is when they lose sight of the impact. And the owners that burn out are the ones that... Uh, they don't, they actually could not create the impact desired. That's a, oh, wow. I haven't thought about it that way. That's uh that's, that's very intriguing uh, thought process there. It's just my perspective, but, right? No, I, I, I love it. Uh, 
to have impact generally you have to hone your superpower most people would say like that's how you actually get the leverage to do what that is what's your superpower casey i've got a few of them um i've also got a lot of weaknesses but i would say the the one that keeps coming up that more other people share with me is i can take very very complex things and they become very simple immediately right uh and a lot of that is process systemization and and just taking things that identifying what the priority is and what the root is, you know, and being able to change quickly and abruptly to go after that root or to go after that very simple, simple movement and knowing the rest of the pieces will fall into place. How, how did you, obviously people told you this uh, in, in that regard, how did you determine that? If it, Obviously a listener is saying like, I'm not sure what that is, or like, I, I have like some things I'm pretty good at, but I don't know what the yeah. one that makes sense to like really hone in on to leverage. How, how do you come to that determination? Pick up the phone and ask every team member, every employee you work with and ask, what do you love about working with me? What's, how do I help you? What am I amazing at? And then make sure you ask the other way, what am I terrible at and what do I suck at? And yes, please tell me. And I think if you come at it through that lens, um, you'll find out very, very quickly where people really, really value you. I'm so, going to, I'm going to put a caveat there because I've okay. heard this before. Okay. This is if you're not, if you don't have a culture of fear, they will give you truthful answers. But if you've cultivated a culture of fear, they will think that the questions that you're ask, asking, especially on the negative side of, you know, what do you essentially dislike about me? What am I terrible at? Uh, they will not answer truthfully. I will, I will double caveat, uh, Will, uh, in that if, if, yes, if you run your business like a dictator, you are also most likely uh, not going to slow down and ask these questions because you have some type of facade or something rooted that's create, requiring you to operate as a dictator. And I'll triple with caveat therefore, to say dictators are bad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is true. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, would, I would say uh, don't worry about your superpower if you have a culture of fear and start to figure out how to get back to a collaborative environment because um, you'll be shocked how much faster the company can grow. You also are probably fooling yourself to believe that the the dictatorness of you is you're probably thinking that that's a superpower, which in fact is actually uh, your kryptonite. Correct. Dictatorship so, usually helps. It, it, you know, just something interesting on this, and I see this a lot in the construction industry, so that's why I'm bringing it up. A lot of times, you know, we'll see people that kind of come with that power hungry, need to control the decision. You know, it's always their it's always their idea. They always think they're the smartest person in the room. You know, all, all the warning signs of, of what that looks like. You see it a lot in this industry, actually. And my, my experience of it has told me that it, it's you if you're like, I can't seem to break through the next level of leadership. If you like go through leaders and you're just cycling through leaders and supervisors on site and you can't figure out how to get through that, high probability, this is one of your roots. Just for those listening is, I, I wonder if so, someone's going to introspect. Word. Yeah, I wonder if someone in here is going to introspect uh, that's listening. If we can affect even one person listening to this call, we've done our job. So thank you, Casey. Yeah, we'll take it. Didn't hear it from us. <laughs> right. Um, so what's the difference between succeeding and failing in entrepreneurship? Mm -hmm. I have a mantra that I talk a lot about. Um, and it's it's not if. It's when it's something I talk a lot about. It's not if it's when, you know, this whole like fiscal calendar year that we set annual revenue targets and profit targets and scale targets, whatever, whatever the heck you're, you're driving towards in your business. Uh, I cannot tell you how many times I see people make irrational decisions or judge and define success or failure based on a irrelevant timeline of results. And so Here's what I would say. If you have casted a vision, if you are doing this with other people, um, if you have successfully built a model that has a decent profitability, you are successful as an entrepreneur. That's my, that's my opinion. I think there are all different levels. I think every entrepreneurial journey is different. And again, I, I state this so many times to everybody. People, again, mostly are like, they judge based on like, wow, they're a $500 million construction company. I'm a $20 million construction company, or I'm a, I'm a million dollar construction company. I'm not successful at all. That is not true. It should be based on what is the ambition level that you want to get to and why do you want to get to that? And I've seen $20 million construction companies 
making half as much as a $10 million construction company. So who is more successful? Oh, but top lines for 20... top lines for vanity, bottom lines for sanity. But, but the, yeah. But the 20, but the, the $10 million business owner might be focused on their success lines as what's the, what's the future sale of this? Do I have the best margins? Are we, are we operating, you know, cleanly and the $20 million business might, you know, might be focused on, we want to make as big of impact as possible. We're, we're not worried about profit. I don't need the money. I have more than enough money. Um, I'm focused on delivering this product and that's, we, we want to change this output in the market. So there's all these different reasons why you might do it. And then the 10 million who has the better profit, maybe their team members aren't paid as well. And so they can't provide as well for their families. So you just, you never know all the dynamics. And I think entrepreneurship and building a business is so freaking complex that you'd be, you'd be a little ignorant to come out and say success or failure is only based on, did I hit my goal for the year? Because again, it's not if, it's when. Set the goal. You keep going till you hit the goal. If you hit it between July 1st and you know June of two years later when you thought you'd hit it, good thing you went for it. Good thing you set the goal. Do you? We talk about mindset a bunch. Do you think entrepreneurs more or beat themselves up more or over-exaggerate how, how great they are? <laughs> That's a great question. I've never actually thought through it that way. I, I mean, I at first blush, when I hear the co- the question, I go, <laughs> I go I, 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 for whatever reason in my head, I'm like, it's down the middle. Like, and the only reason why, right, is because I'm thinking, of, I, can, I can think of too many owners that like, it's a confidence issue. <laughs> and they're just like, they just beat themselves up and they're their biggest enemy. But then on the other end, it's like, we all know there's a lot of ego in owners. And I, I'll be frank, you actually need a lot of ego to get off the ground, right? To get through those initial scales, you need a lot of ego. And then there's a time where that ego has to freaking hit the road and it can't exist anymore. Um, but when that, but when that ego is hit, I, I mean, I can't tell you how many times it's like the dreamer, right. And they're just like, when they're talking about their business, they're, they're already acting like they're this really big deal. And then you dig in and you're like, Oh wow. Like this is not what you think it is. Um, and you're a little clueless. You've never like actually slowed down to look at what other people around you have done. Um, you know, in the similar industry, the similar market. So I don't know. I, I think it's both. I don't know. I don't know if I, I'd be interested to get some data on that, like inter, interview a couple thousand entrepreneurs and be like, is, have they gotten here from like ego and like their shit doesn't, you know, stink. And they're like coming from that place or are they, are they like just like down in confidence? And so they just beat themselves up. It'd be well, well then you need to have uh, a, a truthful indicator of how egotistical or how, how close to the truth they, uh, they are with their answers first, because they might not be self-aware as to where they're <laughs> yeah, at. Man. Well, that, that'd be part <laughs> of it, right? They get the lie detector out and just like, like, yeah, that's, that's not bad. Actually. Maybe <laughs> uh, Cultivate can have a conference and then you can just run this experiment. That'll be great. That'll be a lot of fun. I'm interested in this lie detector here, conference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I can think of a lot of other things I might teach besides <laughs> that. But I, I would definitely say, you know, for the learning opportunity, I would definitely say, like, if you are somebody that, you know, is is low in confidence or you find yourself being a little negative, like, find somebody in your life to lift you up. Like, find find a partner. You know, if you're if you're operating this solo, go get, go find a business partner who has a lot of confidence, you'll, you, you'll be the perfect, um, you know, equation for each other. If you are, if you find that you are, again, maybe you have a level of introspection here that's tough to even see this, but if you do find often that you just are feeling like, oh, I've got this, like I'm crushing it. I'm always doing really well. Find a business partner who's kind of a procrastinator or a negative, you know, always looking for the, you know, pessimistic approach um, just to pull you back a little bit. You know, my, my business partner and I, we have that. I'm very optimistic person, very optimistic of we will achieve this. Why wouldn't we be able to do it? Let's go figure this out. I don't know why we couldn't. Um, you know, my my business partner is very pessimist, like wants to slow things down. Why would we do that? Like, I don't know. I don't think that's going to make sense. Um, you know, and we we battle it out often. And it's it's a it's a really good fit for us. This is, I don't think we've talked about this before, but uh, there's a book called Rocket Fuel that talks about the VI relationship, visionary yes. in, uh, integrated relationship. This is like uh, Walt Disney and his brother. You've never heard of his brother, but he's the one who actually got the shit done. Uh, yeah. And then you need the crazy visionary with the 999,000 ideas, but only one of them is great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Focus. yeah. <laughs> yep. That's exactly right. Is so, that, is partners, that's interesting. Uh, is that a thing that you, and again, obviously every individual situation is different. So this isn't like a, a blank statement, but do you think that having partner or partners 
does add a lot of value to to companies. I really hope so, because I, I literally have built a business off becoming business partners without equity um, for entrepreneurs to figure out how to grow and scale their company. So my short version, my first answer is, yeah, I really hope so. But do I believe it? I do. Um, you know, I think that I think that and this is cliche. Everybody says it. But, you know, being an owner can really, truly be lonely. Like it, it, it is it is real. And I don't think I don't think people fully understand what from the outside world of running a business, what what people mean when you say it's lonely. Right. Or like leaders listening in maybe like it. It's lonely in that the stress and the burden financially ends up falling on you. It's lonely in that when you try to talk to your significant other, they can't actually fully relate. And even when they think they can, they can't. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it is a unique experience to have that pressure, to have that ownership, you know, instilled upon you. And so for me, I think when you, when you are the only one talking against the wall and you're only hearing your own thoughts, the level of detail you'll go into, the, the downward spirals you'll fall into, or the obliviousness that you'll you'll have as you move through your, your business is uh, very, very easy. Uh, and it happens a lot. And when you but when you have a talk track and you're able to collaborate back and forth with somebody that has that shared experience, I do think you'll make better decisions. I do think you will naturally uh, come from a different place and take a take a look at other shoes. And by having a partner, you're almost forced to to learn how to share a bank account, to learn how to collaborate. Um, so it naturally allows you to do that with your team members in a, in a different way. So, you know, because you, we're talking about this introspection, we're talking about, um, you know, business owners, entrepreneurship, uh, and the, and kind of where the journey is between business owner to CEO. Um, what should a business owner delegate, uh, as far as departments or divisions, you know, to leaders instead of holding up everything, right? That's kind of where that kind of transition happens. Um, when and when and why? Yeah, let me, let me talk about these five stages I've mentioned, because I, I think that's where it connects. Cause I think there's different, there's different timing for different things that need to happen. And, and every business is going to go a little different, right? It depends on what type of entrepreneur are you. Are you the technical entrepreneur that's like building a business because you have a technical idea, but you're a terrible leader, right? Are you, are you, are you actually a visionary and like a big, big leader, but you, you really, really struggle. You can't get in the weeds. You can't focus. You can't get in the details like the Walt Disney, um, you know, kind of share there. Um, or, you know, are you, are you more of like an integrator? Like you, you actually like to take other people's ideas. You like to connect dots and like you, you like to empower others to go off and do things like depending on what type of leader or entrepreneur you are can also really dictate how you might approach what you delegate, why, when, how, et cetera. Um, but I, I've got these five stages that I've, I've created over the years and it's, it was mostly stemmed from, you know, we've worked with thousands of business owners at this point and very, very intimately. And we have a very clear uh, lines of when people get stuck and it keeps being very consistent of when they get stuck, no matter the industry, no matter the skill set of the entrepreneur, you know, et cetera. And, you know, stage one is really the hustler. Like it is, it is mo most people don't understand is like when you are the solopreneur stage one, or you have an employee or two, you usually have a capital financial issue. It's your scale. You usually have no idea how much it costs to get the scale. Number two, you don't realize how limited resources you actually have. And number three, people don't value that every hour you spend has to be so insanely productive and only on the right priorities that you can actually hustle your way out of that stage. You can have a great idea that never gets off the ground because you didn't actually hustle out of it. And I've never, I've never, I've seen people get stuck in the solopreneur and it's because they're focused on all the wrong things. They're thinking about what the bigger companies are doing. But at the end of the day, when you're in the hustler, only thing that matters is sales and quality. Could we sell more? And are we doing a good enough job so I keep getting referred and everybody talks about my product or service? There's nothing else that matters. Your website doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. No one's seeing it. You're tiny. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't, right? Like, who am I going to hire? Who cares? Because you're not going to be able to pay payroll anyway. Okay. So if I hire the right person. I don't care doesn't matter yet. You're going to replace them all anyway because you're going to change what this business does five times before you start to scale most likely when you're in that stage. Okay. That's, so. that's super interesting. 
because no, awesome. everybody like preaches state, the, the hire hire the best person like hire the best person in whatever whatever capacity you put that in but like that's when when you know that things are going to change because you're just in a hustler mode like it doesn't matter it that's wow i love that well it's just again if your goal is to get out of the solopreneur stage or the you know one or two employees reporting into you if your, your goal is to get out of that stage as quick as you possibly can I'm not saying don't hire good people, by the way. I'm just saying, what are you focused on and spend all your energy on? More sales and are you delivering a quality product? Yes or no? Do you know how to, do you know how to control your sales? And do you know how to, you know, have a quality product? And did you build it on the right financial model? Nothing else actually matters. If you look at, if you go look at 5,000 businesses, I can show you thousands of business owners who hired really crappy people and got out of that stage. But I can't find anybody. I can't find anybody who got out of that stage if they didn't figure out how to get sales. Right. Sales cures all ails. <laughs> it does at that stage. At that yeah. stage. It absolutely yep. does. It absolutely so, does. okay. So that's the first stage. First uh, stage. Hustler. Are you a hustler? Next stage. Experimenter. Right. And as you think about being an experimenter, why is that the stage? You don't know what you don't know. And usually people create lots of babies, meaning all different types of products and services. They over cannibalize and complicate their business. Um, and what happens is they actually have to start, you know, figuring out what are they going to scale on? But they don't know. They need to test a lot. Who's going to be your hiring persona? Who's going to be your ideal client? Right? You're testing and trying. What types of processes or systems do we need to build in this thing? actually be able to continue to scale and you're probably a you need to be a yes man or, or yes gal like you know i think richard branson says it the best right it's like if i'm presented an opportunity you know and it's a big opportunity and i don't know how to do it i say yes and then i figure it out later you want to take it's at those moments like i'll take any revenue oh you, you think i can do this for you let me see if i can because that might be the pain point or the need that scales faster than what you are already doing people come in to box this is where the controllers people are really feeling like they have to control everything. This is where they usually get stuck because they're not actually letting the market tell them what they need to go do. Instead, they're so focused on what has to happen because that was their idea. And this is the stage where you learn your ideas don't normally win. Mm, okay. Otherwise so... you get stuck. You get stuck in experimentation. Is this also the place where you find entrepreneurs that, uh, are well read, put it that way, of like, these are the things I need to do to to scale, right? But like, you're at such a small, small size of business. It, when you start talking about scaling, it's like, you're so far away from that. But like, no, you just got to get shit to work. Like we're in the get shit to work phase and figure out what works best. And then, yeah. and then think about that stuff. Okay. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, that's exactly what it is. And again, it's, this can be a company that has five or six employees reporting them. They may have one or two, you know, mid, mid, mid level leaders. I mean, it doesn't have to be tiny, but it's, 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 there is a stage in which it does make sense to say yes to everything and to try things and to, to always be lifting underneath every rock to try to figure out what is the right way. Cause you don't usually start that way. It, it's very rare. You start doing it the right way from day one. That's right. Don't, no one has a golden, uh, or crystal ball to fit, you know, to know what you're supposed to be doing. And right. no one teaches this in schools and every business is different in how they approach. It's complicated. Yeah. Will it's likes complicated. to call it entrepreneurial tax when you keep doing the wrong things to figure out the right things. Wasn't that just insanity? <laughs> well, that too. <laughs> That's entrepreneurship. I thought, do I thought right, they like, were next to each it, other in the dictionary. Just keep doing the same results, but you know, same <laughs> thing, same results. It's terrible. So, so, so the next one is a complete counter to the experimenter, right? Like now you're going to the visionary stage and often people in the hustler and experimenter try to jump the visionary too fast. And that's why they get stuck back in the other stages because you can't go to visionary stage until you know exactly your, your very simplified product service or widget, you know, exactly who is your ideal persona as a client, you know, exactly who's your ideal percent of candidate of who's going to work for you. You know, your org chart, you, you see the North star and you're starting to cast that vision. And this is a really important step. It's where the owner starts to look at their team as their client, and they no longer look at the end user as their client. Because the team is going to look towards the client. They're going to take care of the client. Your job now as the owner is to take care of your team. Your team is actually more important 
than the client. And that's a transition mm. that has to happen. Well, that's, 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 that's Richard Branson next. right there. What's that? that? That's Richard Branson right there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Richard, Richard will talk about this stuff a lot. And it's, and it's, um, but it's, it is true. If you look at how people scale, they start to put all of their energy into the development of their people. They start to put all of their energy as, as the owner of the company into what decisions do they want to make? What's their confidence, right? But you also have to kind of come out with high galvanization and go, look, this is the North star. This is where we're going. You start telling people, you start getting people to dream with you to what this could actually look like. And you don't, you don't state where you're at, but you use data and proof of, but remember, we're the best at this product. We did our testing. We know why this works. This is what we do. We're not going to go outside this box. And you're no longer a yes man or yes gal. You're actually a no man, no gal. In fact, you're always looking to say no, because that infringes on our box. We made our box. We are all inside of it. No, we do not do that. That will break something. Nope, we can't do that. That will limit our ability to scale and get to that North Star. That'll become a distraction. How does a leader or a founder, owner, what if their skill set isn't developing people? Like, you know, like in, yeah. does that then say you need a partner? Like there's not like you, if you can't do that, you'll never get to this stage. Is that a little no, bit? You can bring on a team member. You can bring on a team member, okay. right? You might need to bring on a team member who helps you cast the vision and, and does that while you keep leading your people or you might be the visionary and you have to bring on somebody to help lead. You know, it doesn't have to be a business owner. It doesn't have to be a, I mean, it doesn't have to be another owner, another partner. Got it. Again, okay. you bring on the right team members at the right time, but that's, that has to be the direction of the company. If that makes sense when you're in that visionary stage. And again, I think people hit these different levels where that vision is casted. And I, I think a lot about a tree, like as a simple analogy, it's like you have all the roots, right. That are, that are, that are digging in. So you have this idea and the roots start to build out underground first. And what it's doing is it's searching for water. It's searching for the biggest lifelines it can. And then what happens, right? Yes, 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 yes. Keep expanding underground. Keep expanding. Then what happens? You shoot up the trunk. It's a singular concept. You don't have a lot of, most trees, right? We're not talking about evergreens. Most trees that are, you know, talking about maples, you throw them up and you start, you don't see a lot of branches coming off yet. It's a silo focus because you have to get to a certain size to overcome the expenses, to overcome you know, to get to get a horizon to look out and start to capture enough sunlight so you actually have clarity of what's happening in your market. And then you start to see branches come out. And those are the different product lines or the different solutions or the different systems or the different products. But you have, there's a period of, of growth that you have to acknowledge where you have to put a box, not let anybody in and just keep everybody focused to this big North Star vision in the most simple scale possible way. I am going to uh, reiterate that your superpower, the people that tell you uh, explaining complex things simply, uh, it is that. That is what it is. There's no question that you do that well. Uh, just ba simply based on the, the tree analogy. Like that's a great way to explain. So, the, so, their, so their energy really is focused on now their internal people, right? Mm -hmm. The focus is switched to, you know, essentially their people and then uh, making sure that everyone's on the same page as far as vision and that yep. they're able to really yep. start really focusing on that vision. Okay. So that's the visionary stage. What's the next yep. stage then? Systemizer. So now, so now we're trying to systemize the business, right? Because as you start to bring on more people, why do businesses fail? Human capital sucks, right? Humans make mistakes. You make errors. And if you think about systemization, you know, again, people down in the hustler stage or the experimenter stage, hardworking or trying things out, they try to build systems at that time because there's advertisements. I mean, there's more noise to business owners than there's ever been, right? The, the online social media, the ability to get emails into my inbox, the amount of text you get now, you know, from advertising. I mean, you, the FOMO that owners feel at all times is terrible. You have to put all that out and go, I don't need to systemize this yet. I don't even have my product yet. But once you do have your product. And now once you start to see success in the outside market and you have, you're able to hire people and be leading in that direction, you're going to start to over-systemize this because you want to protect it. And I think a lot of like you build a plan, right? That's a map. You build a plan and you have a map. You go, come on, everybody. We're going to take this step, this step, and this step. These are the turns, turn-by-turn -turn directions we're going to take to go from here to the destination. Why when you take those highways, when you take those roads, why does the government put up all those guardrails along the sides of the highways? Keep you safe. 
safety. You don't want anybody to come track. out, right? You don't want anybody to, to drive off the road, go off the cliff, you know, if we're driving like down beautiful Highway 1. You have to have guardrails. So think about your business that way. You can create the plans. You can create this turn-by-turn directions. You can have great people. People will still make this, make mistakes, and they will drive off the cliff. Okay? So you have to start to put in guardrails. That's where technology comes in. That's where even security systems can come in. That's That's where you start to put the different elements in place where it is usually not a person and it's a process or a system that keeps people on the road. And how do you know which process and systems to build? Look at where the most people are going off the road and then go to the next place that has the next amount of people going off the road. Don't build all like anybody who thinks they're I'm a systemizer. We're going to over, we're going to system systematize everything in our business. Yeah. And you're going to write it down in a 25 page document and no one's ever going to look at it ever again. (laughs) <laughs> the worst use of time money and energy any owner can ever do you have to go problem by problem by problem slowly and prioritize it this can be a long stage this is also the stage where you're starting to move from i'll call generalist to specialist you were hiring generals they often were wearing multiple hats you needed them to do a lot of different functions you're now going to start to convert specialists you know how a lot of owners are like it's like I had to start over. You always hear that story, like that crux in the entrepreneurial journey where it's like, I like had to turn over my staff or like I had a big fallout of staff. I had like, what's usually happening is the generalists are frustrated that you're pinning them down into a specialist role, right? And then you go out and hire somebody very specialist towards the exact function or output that you need in your business. That's actually usually why that consistent story keeps repeating itself. So longest stage is here yeah. or can be, Okay. Um, because you're really converting people, the people that initially were hired might not be the right people to do this. They might still be there, but the, even their roles will have to, will have to change because you are now delegating. This is like a second level of delegation. This is at least a second leadership. It's another level of leadership too, right? Like in the visionary stage, it's like, you, you know, you know, it's like you're getting your team together and it's like, rah, rah, we're all together. We're this, we're this tight unit. And then you move to this next level where it's like, actually, I need my sales team to be a tight unit. I need my marketing team to be a tight unit. I need my operations team to be a tight unit. You start, you start to build, you know, you start thinking about departments now. It's like, I'm leading departments. I'm not leading team, a team. I have multiple teams I'm leading. Like that's, I'm just trying to give you vernacular that you've probably heard or you've even experienced yourself guys in your own business. Right. And so listeners, as you listen in here, it's like understanding where you're at and how you need to behave in that, in that, that stage is very important and again where most people screw this up is they go to the stage before they're ready it's very expensive they can't figure out how to become profitable you have it all has to work together okay so final stage we ready for the final one yeah i'm ready so yeah let's hear it influencer so now you've built an entire leadership team ideally you are in a position now where you are going to influence the business. You are no longer actually making decisions and driving the business because you have leaders that are supposed to be doing that. So ideally, the biggest lesson you have to learn at this point is my job is to identify the goal, align and collaborate on the goal with my leader. But I do not get to choose the path anymore. The path to the goal, I no longer have a decision on. Right. And, and that is now when you are learning to influence the business. And you're, you're stepping back and you're shielding the outside market. This is, you know, big, big, big time CEO mentality. But a lot of times you are coming at that business from a place of knowing that you have everybody's going in the same direction. And all you're doing is trying to influence the direction, but you actually pass the torch of decision making to your leaders. Now you run the business and you are obsessed. Your end client is your leaders. In fact, this is when you start to move away and you don't even actually a lot of times know your team members. You don't know your employees that you work with. It's a weird environment where like you're used to knowing everybody and then you're like at a session or you're at something with a team and you're like, who's that guy? That's normal. That's a normal feeling to have. And a lot of entrepreneurs that have hit a lot of scale will look back in those moments and go, one of the weirdest things was having no idea who one of my team members were. They could walk by me tomorrow and I'd have no idea who they were. That's got to be super odd. Obviously, being in a smaller business and understanding, like, even if you you grow to 150 people, 
generally you'll understand like and you're not going to know everybody intimately by any means but like oh yeah that's that's bob he's an accountant i I don't maybe know bob's wife's name but i like i know bob's an accountant but you get to a certain point where it's like i didn't know we even this i didn't know i i didn't know this human being lived in the city that i'm in like you know you had no concept of this human being at all uh that's got to be that has to be eye open doesn't mean everybody now caveat to these five stages people hear me talk about this and i you know i speak on stage a lot about this concept and how people are at and why you need to know what stage you're in respect the stage you're in and then understand what stage you want to get to is because most people hear it and they go okay i want to go become an influencer maybe actually not maybe you shouldn't actually do that right like there are some people that are destined to move to that influencer stage there's some people that are would be amazing at the systemizer and influencer stage, and they have no business being in the hustler and experimenter stage. They're terrible at it. That's why you see owners turn over, CEOs get bought out, right? Because they can't figure it out past those stages. So it's also when you're super, all the way back, right? Superpowers. Know what your superpowers are and put yourself in a position to thrive as that superpower within that stage. And set your goals to go, I'm going to get to this level. And stop. That's maybe with the time when the exit needs to happen. Or that's when I choose to let it continue on as a lifestyle business until I am ready to make the sale. Again, I view success as I figured out, I figured out how to grow my business to a certain level and I only work 10 hours a week. That's a cool success story. Oh yeah. I also think it's successful is like I became the largest construction company in the state. That's awesome. That was what you deemed as what was necessary to be successful. But you can be an experimenter with five employees, two crews running. And you you got them running and a simple construction business running down the road and you're happy and you don't work more than 40 hours a week and you make good money and you have time with friends and family. You've got to choose what your end goal is and what your end destination is. And hopefully you can be introspective enough to understand where, where's your superpower until you're ready to take that next stage up. Cause it is very expensive to go to each of the next stages. So this really sounds a little similar to the grinder curve uh, in terms of stages and sort of the challenges that you go through. It's a little bit different way of looking at and thinking about it, yep. um, but the different phases and sort of the challenges uh, before you sort of get to the next one. Uh, yep. Or if you go too too early, you kind of fall back to correct. That can be actually your, to your detriment. Yeah, it's very similar in terms of concept for sure. Um, for anyone that uh, doesn't know what I'm talking about, go listen to the uh, Mark Sheeran episode. Um, we talked a lot about the Griner curve in that episode. Awesome. So, so go ahead, Justin. So obviously Cultivate Advisors helps businesses uh, on their path to to whichever level that makes sense uh, in regards to their right. their vision of success and what that looks like. Um, you're obviously a wealth of knowledge. Anybody listening could be like, yeah, this, this guy, is, he, he knows what he's doing. Um, what, when you look at the market though, and as you mentioned, like you get so much emails and text and social media, all this stuff nice. of like, this is how you run your business. This is how you do it. Do this thing, do this thing, do this thing. What is, when you look at the market, like what other solutions are in the market that, that you see? And like, how do you like categorize those? Like, you know, how your, your cultivate is one thing. Yeah. Where are all of these voices? Uh, where do they, what buckets do they fall in? Well, they have like the DIY self learning bucket, right? Where it's like, I'm going to go watch YouTube videos. I'm going to read, you know, I'm going to read all the books um, and I'm going to self-interpret. Um, and that can be great as long as you come at it from that bucket of this is perspective and paradigms, um, but not necessarily everything I should act on immediately because I can't act on all of it all at the same time. And you mean you it can't actually. do everything at once, Casey? No, what are you talking about? I thought you just did everything. <laughs> and, and so you have to really be careful you have to be really be careful if you're, in the, if you're in the DIY bucket, right? And so um, just, just be mindful of that. Like that's how most entrepreneurs actually learn is my experience is they, they kind of do the DIY bucket. They don't prioritize their own development. They don't spend on their own growth. They don't spend on their own education. Um, you know, so just be mindful of that. Uh, when you get past the DIY, then, then you have what I, I'm going to call, and I'm going to get in trouble for this, but, you know, the, you know, the folks that are like the gurus. Like if you see somebody on a camera 
and they have a plane or they have a really nice house or a really nice car behind them, I would move on. I would just move on. Okay. Just just move on. Who doesn't uh, like planes and cars, Casey? The Come probability, on. The probability of their level of success has actually probably come by leaning on people that couldn't read through that and understand that that was all a coy and a distraction to try to make you me seem successful. Anybody who feels like they have to persuade people by showing those visuals um, actually probably have not seen a certain level of success. Um, and not that some haven't used that to rise to massive fame or massive success. But again, remember that word fame. If somebody is teaching for the purpose of fame, just be very careful of that. I can't stress that enough. So that's the guru model. So I'm not as big a fan of the guru world. I, I'm down. I think I think Richard is a genius for like the click funnel, you know, that he built. But man, that's gotten out of him. That's my my personal my personal progress. That if, if that actually kind of speaks to the fact that like the skill that they actually have is like becoming famous. Like like that's the thing that like if you followed their steps to if you wanted this to become famous. That actually would, and again, not necessarily build your business, but it would may, perhaps monetarily give you an advantage. But that's generally not the thing that they're selling. Like that's, you know, generally that's not, it's not, they're saying, this is how you run your business better. Follow me. I look amazing. Check out this cool Dubai trip that I went on, whatever. Right. But like the, their thing is like, I figured out how to get people to give me money because they, because I'm famous effectively. That's a, that's a very simplified version of that, but that's essentially what they actually do extraordinarily well. I mean, go on G2, go on Google reviews. If you can't find thousands of Google reviews for a guru that's charging two fifty, three hundred dollars $300 for this so-called fix it product, they, they don't exist. <laughs> All right. That's good advice. And if they don't have if they don't have a page to give a Google review or they don't have a place to leave G2 review or whatever site you're looking up, there's a reason why they've done that. Ooh. Just just remember lack that. of scale. Just just, <laughs> just remember that. Okay. Um all right. So so the next one that I, I think is really great is actually I'm gonna call like the peer development. And there's a lot of different ways to get into peer development. So, you know, from like the EO world, right? Um uh, of getting getting a chance to have you know peer to peer conversations and more of like the network and events to bounce ideas or to get into the mentorship groups that can be a great program across the country or YPO even of, of you know getting into certain levels of tiers to be able to talk to people at your same level um, you know you've got to be careful on those and you've got to realize what you're going to get out of those because uh, it can be very beneficial but you're going to you're going to be able to get stuff like what have other people faced this? How have they solved it? So if you're really good at learning of hearing how other stories have worked, that can be great. Hearing other people's pain points can start to tell you what you might experience in the future. Like that can be a good use. My experience has been the facilitators within those types of programs have generally not always had as much success of transferring knowledge. Unless they've been a business owner themselves, they've gone through the experience and they're able to actually tangibly tell you how to, how to do it in your business. So just be mindful what you're going to get when you're in the peer-to-peer -peer development world. But again, that can be a great, great resource and asset of how to manage it. Then you get to kind of what I'm going to call the, the, uh, the owner advisory. And there's either group or one-to-one. -one. Group advisory can be great if you're going into like an industry program. So if, if, you're, if you're construction or you're architecture, go find a group that's like, we're going to train you. And that's really where you're going to probably learn like the ins and outs of your industry. If you're a little smaller in size, those can be great for you because in a group environment, you can hear what other people are struggling with, but somebody's actually teaching you and showing you. It's usually curriculum based, so you can review the curriculum before you actually go through. That can be a great program and a great way to get your business to the next level. Again, mostly I see that in industry form. Otherwise, how would they be able to build a curriculum, right? Then you're going to have, then you have like the one-to-one -one advisory. That's where we sit, a one-to-one -one coaching, one-to-one -one advisory. And you know, shameless plug for us. There are 300,000 of these folks that call themselves business advisors or business coaches in the LinkedIn. There are approximately like 13 or 14 companies that have scaled past five employees. So the people who teach it haven't scaled it themselves. Make sure anybody you work with on a business coach or as a business advisor in a one-to-one -one environment, if you want it to be really good, make sure they do not have a curriculum, that they're going to completely tailor it to you. And then number two, make sure that the advisor themselves have ran a business had to worry about payroll, sleepless nights, have been through that experience 
So they're on the same level of discussion with you. And be very careful. Most people that go down this space want to find the entrepreneur that's way bigger than them, that's experienced so much. That can actually be worse for you because that owner that's way up in the clouds can't remember what it was like at the stage that you're in. And you end up getting advisory through like war stories. That's not helpful. What you actually need is you need somebody that's similar at your level of running a business, either at your level or just a little bit above. But what it is, is that your weaknesses are their superpowers. Because no one can know the game of entrepreneurship. You're, you're asking me things because you prep for this conversation, guys, and you know what I'm really good at. So you're, 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 you're silvering it to me on a silver platter. I can tell you some areas of the business you start to ask me about that I'm scratching my head, just like everybody else. You can only be good at so much of it. So your job is to figure out what you're good at and then find somebody next to you to come alongside you and really help you think through critically of how to get from A to Z. And the last one is go take a bunch of cash and get a board of advisors who are sitting on your board telling you how to do it and just know that eventually they're going to buy you 100% out. So that... That last one seemed uh, the, the easiest in regards to time. Uh, that, <laughs> that's what I will be. say. It can't well, be. For sure, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with any of them. You just got to know what you're getting yourself into. For We're sure. a consultant. So uh, consultants uh, like the McKenzie's or, or, or whatever. Um, sure. Where do they fall into all of this? Yeah, I mean, that's really where you're starting. It's like outsourcing, right? Like when you start to bring in a consultant, it's like because you need a third party perspective or you need somebody. I don't actually look at that as like your development. That's no different than having an employee. It's no different that you're just choosing to outsource versus having an employee do the work. You could have a leader do the exact same thing that any Bain or McKinsey could do. Okay. It's just, are you, are you able to hire that person? Can you afford that person? Are you able to, have, is there enough work for that person? Or do you have a set project or a certain solution? You're choosing to outsource. No different than taking my product line somewhere else. Okay. You're just taking strategy somewhere else. And that, that's now, it's not the same relationship because now you're actually leading them of, of what the output is versus a coach or an advisor, at least in our world, it's more equal. Like it's, it's a collaborative discussion to figure out how to get from A to Z. And that's more appropriate. And that's why you don't see McBain or McKenzie work with companies less than hundred million in size. I okay. was just about to say the price point of those uh, firms yeah. are yeah. generally outside of the really uh, standard skilled, entrepreneur. <laughs> well, really skilled human capital is very, very expensive, especially on a fractional level. So in two minutes or less, can you talk a little bit about your process, sort of the questions you know what I'm talking about, kind of your initial intake, because I thought it was very interesting. It helped. Uh, I don't want to give away too much. I want you to talk about it in two minutes or less. All right. Hopefully I hit it. And uh, now I know I'm talking too long. Now you give me my timeline. Uh, so I would say, you know, first out of the gates, you know, we first have people go through this assessment that helps us figure out what's the industry, what's the light valuation of the company, what's the company actually worth. And then we do a health assessment to actually dictate down through all the different questions of sales, financials, leadership, marketing, recruiting, productivity, understanding the growth and capacity of the business. You self-assess, then we'll actually sit down, match the advisor and sit down with you for two full hours to dig in and go through that in detail and actually prove it out. And the way that we prove it out is by modeling the business and letting data tell us if that's actually what's happening in the business or if it's not. And from there, through those lines of questions, we can figure out what do you want for the business? Great. What's the output? What's the end destination for the business? What's your superpowers? What's your weaknesses? And then we build a roadmap. And from that entire process, you will land on the other side of a clear strategy that you can go implement until you get to the time of when you're going to go sell. I so, really agree. Yeah, that's a really abbreviated, but I think that's really straight to the point. It, it gives a holistic view of, of the business. So you're really able to, to talk to any business, but uh, but even in the construction world, Right, you probably see similar things that happen over and over and over again uh, in the construction side. Why wouldn't you sit down with past entrepreneurs? I've got you know 120 staff, all have been past entrepreneurs that have grown and scaled their own businesses a lot in the construction industry. Why wouldn't you let a third party who's looked at businesses sit down for free and do this assessment? So you, if anything, just steal the ideas. So uh, steal like an artist. That's right. Um, so part of your part of your assessment is to do with technology and leveraging technology. Yep. Um, why is the construction industry behind when it comes to IT and cybersecurity? Why is it that they underspend in that area? 
Uh, first off is education. Um, and I think a lot of times business owners uh, don't transition properly into the mode of like, I have something to lose. Uh, when you start a business, right, you come from a place of like, I have nothing to lose. So I'm just going to work my butt off and hopefully something becomes reality. And then they forget to turn the, the brain, right, to go, now I have maybe something to lose, right? And so technology is that guardrail. Technology is the security side. Technology is, is really creating a force field around your business to protect it. And so I think most people, when they build the business, they don't actually account for those costs early on when they build the pricing structures. And so when they get to that level, when they actually do really need it, when they really truly need to have that turn on, they don't know how to build that back into their pricing. And so they don't spend on it. Ah, so they're, so they're, because they're worried about profitability. They're going, this is gonna, just going to eat into my profits. I'm not going to have much left. But the reality yeah, is something happens and then you don't have any profits. Yeah. Okay. Choose, choose, choose your battle. I love how you said that. Thank you. Uh, Justin, <laughs> I think it's, Justin, I think it's time for our last question. Absolutely. Um, Casey, if you could go back 20 years, what advice would you give yourself? That'd be 2004, uh, you know, because I'm good. I'm pretty good at math, so I can do 20 years off of 20. Kind of funny that that's the year you landed on. That was the first year I ran my first um, home service franchise. Ooh, good time kind to go funny. back in yeah, time, they, you they know what I mean? <laughs> um, well, if I had to go back to that year and give myself advice, uh, my first year of running a franchise, I worked 80-hour weeks, and I figured out how much profit I made at the end of the year. And I think it came out to like $1.80 an hour. And uh, oh, big money. I a good financial model. And I did a good amount of sales. And I, I had two different teams quit, meaning like the entire team of employees quit on me, like walked out, had to explain to clients, like why they were talking crap about me while, you know, re-securing gutters to the home. Um, and, uh, you know, I got to tell you, uh, I came at my business from a place of what we were talking earlier. That's why I'm so passionate about it. I was the one that was coming in dictating. I was the one that didn't know how to listen. I was the one that was was running a business and just, it's my business, you're lucky to be here mentality. And I wish somebody would shook me and said, what you're going to do is you're going to go empower your people and your people are what matter, not you. You don't mean anything. You'll mean something in 10 years from now. And if I could have gone through that learning curve a little faster, I probably could have shaved my learning curve down by five years. Oh, that's great. Oh, that, that, that's uh, it's a great quote right there. I think that'll be posted somewhere. Yeah. I'm pretty positive. That'll be the viral clip. Casey Searwear. Um Great. Just admitting my weaknesses. Let's do it. I'll have, I'll have like painters come out of the woodwork that work for me. <laughs> like finally he figured it out. He's an asshole. <laughs> But then they might be like, hey, now I want to work for you again. <laughs> I've been running a painting business for the last 15 years. Yeah, they, Bingo, they right? Me how to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, uh, you've been great. If somebody wanted to get a hold of you or, or cultivate, what's the best way for them to do that? Just go to cultivateadvisors.com. You can read a bunch of success stories. We've got a couple construction companies on there you can read about, um, you know, and, um, you know, go go through our assessment. It's It's free. There's no harm, no foul. Worst case, you get an idea of how we might help you and how you stack up against your peers. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I will throw all the social stuff in the show notes and, and all that fun. Uh, this has been a blast. Uh, I guarantee listeners have gotten a ton of value out of this one because I, I know I did and, and Will's smiling, so that means he did. Um, so uh, <laughs> hopefully, uh, listeners, you had just as good a time as we did. And until next time, adios. Adios. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to Building Scale. To help us reach even more people, please share this episode with a friend, a colleague, or on social media. Remember, the three pillars of scaling a business are people, process, and technology. And our mission is to help the AEC industry protect itself by making technology easy. So if you think your company's technology pillar could use some improvement, Book a call with us to see how we can help maximize your IT and cybersecurity strategy. Just go to buildingscale.net slash help. And until next time, keep, keep building, building scale. scale. <laughs>